Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on when you are, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host for the day, Pascal Robert. Our normal host, Jason Miles, is away on a brief vacation, enjoying his time off with his family, enjoying his ability to travel about the West Coast freely, unfettered by all of the horrible things we're going to have to talk about today. Today on our show, we'll be talking about what goes with the strategy for the left in the current crises ahead of us. We have wonderful guests, but before we go into our guests, we have to remind you guys that again, those of you who are going to be in the New York City area, and even if you cannot be in the New York City area, you should try to be on June 26th in New York City, the This Is Revolution crew will be teaming up with Sublation Magazine and the Sublation Media crew for our little roundabout. So we're going to have a panel discussion and a meet and greet at the Project Parlor in Brooklyn, New York City. That will be on Sunday. We'll be having a a panel discussion on various aspects of politics. Norman Norman Finkelstein will be there. Ben Burgess, I will be there. Jason will be there. We'll have Doug Lane. We'll have the crew from Sublation Media and Sublation Magazine as well. And it's going to be our introduction to the team, to the world, in the wonderful borough of Brooklyn, New York. So for all of you who can make it, it is free. There will be no cost for the event. Try to make it out as much as possible. As many of you as possible can make it. It will be absolutely awesome. That being said, let us go to today's event. Our My co-host for today is going to be our man across the pond. The wonderful and always interesting with Pithy comments and interesting analysis. Our man across the sea, professor of Middle Eastern studies at Missouri State University, currently residing temporarily in England, Gene Bajlan. Hello, Pascal. It is wonderful to be with you today, and I'm really excited to be discussing today's topic. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be interesting, and I think it's going to be a little bit spicy, too. I think so as well, because today we have the guests. We have the black pill of all black pills. The man, the myth, the legend, my favorite alabaster leftist, the man whose commentary keeps everyone sober on the left, no bones about it, intellectual extraordinaire, host of Varn Vlog, the one and only academic and teacher extraordinaire, shaper of the mind of the youth, C. Derek Vaughn. Like I say, the black Sean King. Or some people would say the Black Shorts King. <laughs> and uh, don't forget, we do have a very special voice as well. Oh, that's right. Oh, uh, we cannot forget that our moderator du jour, the great and the one and only, who is always helping with our show, who should always be acknowledged for her dedication to This Is Revolution podcast, we have M. Toussaint, my, my sister Haitian. 
<laughs> Thank you, Pascal. That was an awesome introduction. I am looking forward to today's show. Varn is here to, what is it, what I say? Varn's here to remind you of the mess on the left when Bernie went away. So. Varn is going to remind us of a few things. Uh, we hopefully <laughs> will be joined in a few minutes by our friend Marcus in Virginia, who used to be our man in vain. I'm not in vain, man in vain, man in vain, I should say. But uh, if, hopefully Marcus should be joining us at some point in the morning. But to begin off our rather spicy chat, let's talk about an article that we should have all have read by now, or at least are aware of, that started uh, circulating yesterday. I was hit up by Gene in my Facebook inbox, and I actually got the article from my man C. Derek Vaughn, who I had the luxury of chatting with yesterday uh, evening before the show, who sent me copious links to be prepared for today. Uh, oh, Marcus is here. Is Marcus our man in Maine in here? Oh, Marcus our man in oh, what? Formerly our man. <laughs> Formerly. What's going our on? Man in, our man in, in vain. Yes. In in vain, in, in vain in me. Marcus, what's good, brother? How are you? I'm good. I, you know, it just took me a minute to like figure out. Uh, let me let me check to make sure I've got everything right here. But uh, Barn, it's good to see you again. What's up? What's up? What's up? Uh, Nothing much. Haven't seen you in a while. So, have, how have we have? How long has have, have we been going? We, is just, this... we just got on. We just did basic introductions. Said hello to everyone. We're about to kick it in. We're about to kick off with the first subject matter, which hopefully you got a chance to check out which was the article in Jacobin that is proposing that Bernie Sanders run for a third time. Well, that would this be, would this is technically a third time or would it be a fourth? Didn't Bernie try to run early on in his political career or this will be a third for president? Um, I'm not third. sure if he had an earlier one, but uh, I mean, third, third good run. Right? Third, <laughs> third real run. Real run, yeah. There's a he threatened to in 2012 to to primary challenge Obama um, and back down. So that's correct. That's correct. Now, this and, article, and, and he's never been it. forgiven for it. He's, that's true. The title of the article for our audience: Bernie Sanders should run for president a third time. <laughs> this is from Branko Marchet, uh, Marchetic. Uh, I don't know if you guys are friends of Branko. Any of you guys familiar with Branko or his work? Branko is the guy who wrote the book, by the way, uh, Yesterday's Man, mm -hmm. The Case Against Joe Biden. I'm sure he's feeling kind of spicy nowadays in the age of Joe Biden. I'm going to put the link to the show in the chat, so hopefully, excuse me, the link to the article in the chat so M. Toussaint can capture it and share it with our audience if they don't have it yet. All right, thank so, you. Here's the question. First question off the bat, what are the overall reactions? To, but before we do that, let's look at the current state of affairs that we have them with the Democratic Party right now. According to all polling data, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that things are not looking bright for the Democrats in terms of the November 2022 election. Most people are expecting them to get profoundly shellacked, there are some people who are positing that the fear of the Supreme Court case on the abortion uh, situation may you know, drum up support for them. The overall overreach of the Republicans in their state apparatuses in trying to overturn Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade as well as the other kind of overreaching may turn out the vote. I think I'm a little bit dubious of those arguments. Some have made the argument that the current brouhaha being made in the media about the January 6th hearings may drum up support overall. Before we get to the article, we're going to get to the 2024 election, but let's talk about the midterms. Vaughn, you're the guest. What, are your, what do you see as the current state of the Democratic Party? And then we'll move to the progressive left in the current moment for the 2024 midterms coming up in November. Uh they're about to be slaughtered. Um, the, the, 
the every indicator that I have looked at has indicated that while there's disorder in the post-Trump Republicans, um, that the Democrats could have taken advantage of um, a few months ago, they have squandered every opportunity to do so and are now focusing solely on the January 6th and the fear of the threat of democracy as their main um, way to mobilize the vote. The, the issue is that uh, the, they're, they can't clearly message on anything. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, I've been pointing out to people that while um, they're trying to use the threat to Roe v. Wade, uh, a real and sustained threat, um, to deal with their loss of suburban elected and basically to get um, mothers back out to vote. They, they have a messaging issue because in places like South Texas, they're running pro-life candidates and supporting them. So they can't really do that. They can't have it both ways. Um, the Tom Kane style. Now, now the the uh, center and and progressive wing of the Democratic Party just kind of hopes you ignore that. They will make arguments. That, you know, that their favorite thing is if Hillary run, we'd never be in this situation with the Supreme Court. Which, uh, given Tom Kane, Hillary's vice president's votes for Amy Coney Barrett, I, I, it's hard to say actually what situation we would be in. Also, there was no way that if Hillary had won in 2016 that the Democrats had a viable chance of taking the Senate. So they would have at best been at stalemate um, when uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. N no, I mean, these counterfactuals that they're trying to run on just aren't going to have a lot of sway. And the, the material situation is very, very hard to justify at a local level. Um, it's hard to argue why even people like uh, Ro Khanna and AOC can vote for sending massive amounts of money to Ukraine while they can't seem to do anything to shore up uh, infrastructure in the U.S. I mean, they've overseen the largest price hike in Medicare history. They have, um, they have floated false hope seemingly in regards to student loan forgiveness. And the reason why we know it's false hope because now the Secretary of, Edu of Education is talking about postponing payments and even longer with no definite end in sight and giving people plenty of time to adjust to paying, indicating that they have no intention of doing even the moderate levels of loan forgiveness, uh, the under 10K thing that Biden was floating earlier, which every legal scholar seems to think he could probably legally do. Um, and, and I actually think that was always the case that he had no intention to do it because why would you float um, your projected uh, strategy on that a month before making a decision so that both the New York Times and Republicans like Mitch Romney could have time to counter you and build up a counter argument to your progressive action. So Biden thinks we're stupid, um, even for a Democrat. And it's showing up in the polls. It's showing up in the polls in demographics that have traditionally been loyal to the Democrats. Now, th there's been an overstatement of the, uh, you know, of the great awakenings, uh, loyalty to the Democrats, period. Um, the historical loyalty of both Latin and Asian voters is the historical loyalty of both Latin and Asian voters um, to the Democratic Party is actually quite new. It really only began in about 2006 with both demographics. Um, the the projection on black men is hard to say because, as we know, felon laws, which disproportionately hit all the poor in the South, but definitely black men um, more than any other group, uh, they have not really been part of polling because they've not been a significant voting block historically. And so the, the loyalty of, uh, of the black community has mostly been 
if we are honest and relatively educated black women. Now, there are a bunch of sociological trends for that. Um, but it it is kind of an undeniable fact. Um, another thing I like to point out uh, in regards to this is that the black representation uh, deals that were made um, in with the fall of the Dixiecrats and people forget the Dixiecrats didn't fall until and in, in most other states until the year 2000 right this is relatively recent history um well they were also revived by the blue dogs yeah yeah, yeah. oh yeah um but when, when a lot of the Dixie a lot of the Dixiecrats became Republicans which is what happened at the state level in places like Georgia South Carolina etc they just changed the D to R's on their on their registration um they cut deals to ensure um, uh, black historical representation at the expense of progressives. Uh, ProPublica has run several articles on this going back to like 2009. Um, and uh, it, it didn't surprise me at all, for example, when Bernie stalled out down there. Well, this the loyalty of that demographic uh, is being challenged i think you've talked about this yourself so and i don't mean that they're going to vote republicans they're just probably not going to vote um uh so this means that they're going to take a shellacking and unfortunately to pivot a little bit to your thing about progressives uh whether we like it or not the progressive state level representatives in places like California and New York are being primaried out um, and recalled successfully. That's a very interesting phenomenon that's worthy of a conversation of itself that we're going to get to. But let's get to some of our other panelists. Gene, you want to jump in now? Or do you want me to go to Marcus first? No, I can jump in briefly. Um, yeah, well, I just want to sort of second what Vaughn is saying at the moment. In fact, go to Marcus right now. That's why I asked. Zal so, yep. so also wanted to second what Vaughn was saying. Um, but no, and I, I, you know, I agree. I guess I'm going to third it. Um, a lot of a lot, a lot of key points as far as um, the decision making on on the party, the Democratic Party as a whole, and where is it led. Um, and that's where it's the this uplifting and black girl magic and start to th you know like they actually get some patronage from um <laughs> from black women but you saw trump got the most black votes than any republican since you know george ever. Was in 20, bush in 2004 i think so yeah and with all of the rhetoric with all of you know things that uh at least coming from the the moderates or you know the democratic party the, all these are the things that are going to keep these going to drive these people to us which is just it's it's just not the case um some and across the board on every issue you know when it comes to immigration student loan debt that Varn had already talked about um any type of deal with like the climate uh any climate provisions he's literally gone back on everything you know all the promises never kept A anyone that it cared about foreign policy, holding Saudi Arabia accountable. That's been, you know, held uh, up to the, the administration's face recently with these, uh, some of the Americas and all this type of stuff. So across the board, right, just overall governance um, with, with you know, uh, the price prices of everything and inflation going up, you know, that's being looked at as a failure. But then it, on each specific policy issue, in which case they can do something, uh, student loan debt, they could do a lot. They're refusing to do anything. And that's so it's not only just like, oh, hey, you know, the Democrats are bad. All of the groups that have actually gotten Joe Biden across the finish line, the groups that are actually getting people to send in the mailing voted. It's a lot of, you know, like there's a good amount of work on these organizations to get these people to buy in. They got absolutely zero from the Biden administration. And so those groups aren't going to be working as hard in the midterms. And yeah, you know, like, like Martin said, like I see I'm beginning to, like, you know, there's we're going to be red everywhere. Like, this is going to be a bloodbath. If, <laughs> if they're lucky, they just is. moderately lose, right? Like if they're lucky, like it's just a slight ass kicking, um, but it could be much, much worse. 
Tia, you ready to jump in? Yeah, I've uh, I've dealt with Zal. He's going to have a nap now. But, uh, yeah, I wanted to second what you guys were saying, basically. Uh, I think Vaughn pointed out something very important. There was a huge inconsistency in the Democrats' position. He points out, for example, you know, there's, uh, you know, they're apoplectic about Roe v. Wade and the sustained attack on uh, women's rights to uh, determine their determine their lives and determine their reproductive cycles. But at the same time, they support uh, pro-life candidates. But more broadly, we're faced with a political discourse which presents the Republicans as fascists, and yet at the same time is attempting to present bipartisanship as some kind of political virtue. And there is just simply, a ma- there's a, the, the, that circle cannot be squared. You can't be uh, driving people uh, through claiming that there's this huge threat on democracy, while at the same time attacking those who reject par- bipartisanship or who are critical of bipartisanship. So I think there's a meta problem in that way. And more broadly, the the, the policy to rely on January the sixth uh, gun control. Uh, clearly, you know, I think we'll see a big gun control bill, which has no chance of passing, being forwarded. Uh, yeah, it already has. Uh, uh, yeah, all this, all these things, are, they, they, they don't work either way for the Democrats. They both serve to mobilize the opposition to the Democratic Party, but at the same time, to the soft supporters of the Democratic Party, they're demoralizing because they have no chance of passing. So you have, you have a politics where there's a lot of, uh, action, but nothing is achieved. And as Vaughn pointed out, there there has been discord uh, within the Republican Party. The Republican Party does not really have a program uh, to offer the country in, in a clear sense of the word. But the Democrats are in power. They're presiding over a cost of living crisis. They're presiding over, uh, you know, a political stalemate. And people aren't going to buy it. You know, uh, it, yes, the January 6th stuff mobilizes their hardcore liberal supporters. But those people were going to go out and vote Democratic Party anyway. That's the, the core of the sport. They don't have anything which seems to be able to cement or concretize their coalition. They aren't able to gain seem to engage in even some kind of patronage politics that would consolidate their their base. Uh, They have no material benefits to offer a broader coalition. And plus, the Republicans are extremely successful in mobilizing these cultural war issues, which is pulling enough minority voters, including, uh, and more specifically men, into either the depoliticized or the Republican camp to mean that given the structure of the American electoral system, the Republicans will be able to get a decisive victory, both on the congressional level and most likely in 2024 uh, on the presidential level. And there's not much the Democrats could do about it because they're, they're all, even within their party, they can't pass their own agenda. So they're just exposed as being impotent and a failure, and their base is becoming increasingly demoralized. The, well, it, I just, it, like, well, part of the, in like, it's, it's, it's it, it, like just an absolutely fruitless effort because, on one hand, they're saying our democracy is at threat and all these things. You need to vote in order for us to fix it even though the Democrats can fix it now. Because like all these things like too is like all these problems are they're accepting these things, right? They could get rid of the filibuster, they could pass whatever the hell they wanted. You know, if there was some type of epiphany, the Democrats could have all the power that they need to fix any of the problems that they, you know, claim to want to fix. That's not happening. Um it's and it's never going to happen. Uh and that's I guess where even, you know, I see some some of the, the students from Parkland who are like, oh, we've been here before. You know, like they like some of them are like <laughs> just completely. 
doom or pilled, I guess, is the way I like about the, the Democrats and doing anything. Um, and that is happening on all types of policy bases where people are saying, we've heard this before. The people who we look into it for a second can say, the Democrats have the power now. And it's, oh, but Manchin at Cinema, you know, and then, um, fuck, who is it? Lieberman before, you know, like this, this it's always going to be somebody and people are going to lose out. It's not that they're going to go to the Republicans. You know, that's the thing too, is that like people are just not going to like buy in. And well, people won't vote. Too? People won't vote. That's the Republican strategy. It's Bo, it's perhaps to win some people over, but it's also is to depend on demoralization and demobilization, which the Democrats are doing very well. Well, how did we get here, gentlemen? Because do we all remember the good old days less than a year ago where there were certain voices that were applauding Joe Biden as being FDR light or FDR 2.0 or the new progressive Joe Biden? We had a guest on our show recently, won't name names, friend of the show. We love him very much. To Joe Biden is the most progressive Democratic president I've seen in my lifetime. Well, if you know where the Democrats have been, like in the 50 year plus counter revolution, that's not really saying much, saying much anyway. That's why I'm noticing Varn and Scarlett is, is, got this look on his face. He was like, and what exactly does that mean? Do you not remember who Bill Clinton was? But yeah, the point well, I'm trying to say Jim is that. Carter, frankly. But yeah, <laughs> the point I'm trying to say is that. There was this kind of patina of uh, allusion to Joe Biden as, you know, the progressive bellwether, his his uh, Build Back Better plan that, of course, we know went to the wayside, was supposed to be one of the greatest, you know, state uh, reallocations of resources to the working class, uh, Biden's uh, uh, COVID response, you know, put money in the hands of people, et cetera, et cetera. This wasn't that long ago. Jeff. Well, that's that's what it was, is the COVID response. That COVID response bill wasn't just a, hey, let's get shots in arms, let's make sure people can get tested or whatever. That came along with a child tax credit as well. That came along with actually something that benefited people. Like And like that seems, there's nothing that people don't love more like than just money in their fucking bank account every month that they can fucking count on. And that all went away. So there was there was something to hold on to. There was something. And they're continuing to try to ride out the well, first yeah. bill that they passed. Because I don't want Vaughn to get bored here because Vaughn is going to be like, Pascal is trying to do this. I see where this game Pascal is playing. I already don't <laughs> like it. I'm, I'm trying to be fair and balanced. I'm not saying that you guys are trying to black Phil Biden. But listen, there was... We know the voices that were saying this. I, I mean, there were, there, there were people like Doug Henwood out there. Uh, Henwood's still doing it, and and still, you know, uh, all power to him. I'm I'm not I'm not criticizing him on a personal level, but there are people like Doug uh, Henwood, Harvey uh, Harvey K. These these people who were saying that there was a potentiality, and I will give the fair point where it is. At the beginning, when they passed the COVID bill, when they started doing the child tax credit, it looked that, yeah, they're not going to do everything we want, but maybe, just maybe, they're going to be able to break with the hardcore neoliberalism of the past and do a little bit of, uh, you know, a bit of a money giveaway to consolidate their base, to consolidate their uh, uh, support. But it just fell absolutely flat crashed and burned with the uh, infrastructure bill. I, it, it did crash and burn with the infrastructure bill. And I want to ask about that because we, we, we're still on our general conversation about Bernie and his third run. Do we believe... This is a question I've had for a while. I asked this question to a couple of guests. We had Adolf, on a, on a, Adolf Reed on the show one time and I asked this question. And I'd like to hear the thoughts of you gentlemen because all of you I respect for a variety of reasons. But I, do we really believe that at the commencement of Biden's administration, the Democrats were pre prepared to pivot away from the neoliberal economic consensus of hyper-privatization, government gutting. We all know the various tenets of, of, of neoliberalism, et cetera, et cetera. Do we believe that there was a, an interest, a legitimate interest, in pivoting away from the neoliberal consensus? I'd like to hear your thoughts. 
so we have to look at a couple of things about the the contradictions of neoliberalism. One is while government gutting has been its ostensible goal during the neoliberal period, the expansion of the state actually has been greater than under um, uh, uh, Fordism or social democracy in either case, depending on what side of the pond you're on. Um, because neoliberalism's answer to the to the problem of marketization was to have the government support it. Now, those of us who understand the history of the long durée of capitalism know that even in the great entrepreneurial capitalist period, that was actually still true. Uh, enclosures were necessary. The state had to set up markets, etc. But the extent of it was massively expanded, so much so that a lot of people, David Harvey, I mean, you know, my, my, how I met Jason Miles was talking about what David Harvey got wrong in his neoliberalism book. Um, uh, often miss that a lot of the old reactionary liberals like von Mises, for example, uh, thought that the neoliberals were um, socialist because of their belief in public private partnerships and the government creating market mechanisms um, and not letting the market do it absolutely. Uh, now, I say this because what I noticed immediately in, in small things, even in the COVID bill, and I'm going to say something that's going to be very unpopular amongst a lot of the left, that was more prominent in the Biden COVID bills and in the bipartisan COVID bills under Trump was the returning of small things like asset buybacks uh, being allowed, the um, uh, things like public-private partnerships where costs would be assumed by the government, but profits would not be, um, et cetera. The, the complication about the neoliberal period, and the reason why I think they might have been slightly thinking that they were going to pivot away from it, um, is that... Everyone who follows monetary flows and markets knows that neoliberalism's claim to be able to float this stuff on an open market without government support really ended in 2007. The markets have been supported indirectly, admittedly. People think QE was just directly injecting money indirectly? into the markets. Indirectly. The market mechanisms of, uh, of no interest loans. All right. But I want people to look at what happened. There is a shift from admittedly declining productive capital into everything being tied up into rents and IPs and venture capital. Now, Berkshire Hathaway, I want you to look at like uh, the difference between the richest men in the world in the 80s, the richest men in the world during the Clinton uh, uh, Bush period, that's when it became Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffett, and the richest men in the world now. Um, the richest men in the world now run businesses that until the end of the quantitative easing period never turned a fucking profit. Say it again for the people in the back. <laughs> like, well, not, not, not only that, and that were heavily subsidized by... Uh, state loans and, and and technical support as well right you know, the, so, the, the, so it's neoliberalism is making billionaires off the back of the taxpayer so they were heavily subsidized by state loans by 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 government contracts uh Amazon by regulation services, by particular by, reg by anti-competitive regulation by by ability to use monopsony power um uh and by the fact that venture capital returns, because they weren't based on anything, just like Bitcoin. I mean, the, people talk about like, uh, Bitcoin. Speculation is the last one. It was one. totally speculation. And no one wanted the speculative asset bubble to drop. And they knew they didn't allow it, no matter who was in charge, because of what Obama did and the way he restructured the banks. Um, they would not allow a speculative asset bubble to pop and have a market correction that was severe. Now, I want you guys to notice this because one of the things about the Biden administration and Biden, I would, I think Biden would love for the Fed to have just said they were going to continue QE like forever. All right. But um, the moment that QE stops, Facebook 
tries to move into some kind of new space to to turn more money and it its stocks collapse but it doesn't just stop with facebook people have been making this stuff about how much money bitcoin has lost but uh amazon stocks are down the same percentage as bitcoin all right now what people have not noticed and they're only beginning to notice because of things like I talked about before on the show on one of the news things about food in the in the baby formula crisis is that the returns on on like ne necessary physical commodities that are not IP branded have been super low forever. Um, but they've been consistent, like people know that if you're like, say, if you're in a pension plan builder and you're now paying out to the pensioners and not building up for it, you know, you can switch to like food futures because it's going to consistently bring in like just enough to, to outpace inflation and you're not going to, but it's never going to fall right until like this year, by the way, which it did. Um, uh, so what we're seeing with this baby shorter formula though, is that meant that they have low investment to re to rebuild, restock and do private infrastructure building. It just doesn't exist. And this is not just a problem for the United States. For people who think it's just a U.S. neoliberal problem, you are fundamentally incorrect. It is a worldwide problem. Where I can only think of one state that has kind of hedged the bet on this, and that is China. And even then, they've only done it in certain areas. So I, I, I think people, I think people in the government in the know. I, and by that, I really mean the military, to be frankly, uh, to be frank with everybody, um, knew that there was a structural limit to neoliberalism, but they had nothing to replace it. Mm. Uh, they they don't feel like they can return to Ford's policies. By the way, I don't think they can, um, because the problem they have, is not they don't, national. Have the trade, they don't have the trade capacity to subsidize mm -hmm. a Ford's economy. Right, exactly. That's exactly right. Like, really, there's only one state on earth that could do it at scale, and that is China. So it's it's um, and unfortunately, everybody's growth model, and this includes people who are against the U.S. and the multipolar geopolitical strategy, actually still requires the the sea lanes and the globalized trade networks to be operational. Otherwise, they also can't integrate their their trade with places like Latin America, like and so this puts everybody in a weird situation. So everybody kind of knows neoliberalism. Its time is up. This phase of capital won't be able to correct itself with these, but they have no idea how to do it, and they have no on, way on, to discipline on, their own bourgeoisie. Before you get too black on the pill. Mm -hmm. Isn't this fundamentally the crisis of the 21st century? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Gene, jump in, because I know you got plenty on the mind. I mean, yeah, I think we are entering a, a, a period of crisis because, of course, these are all political problems. We have, you know, we have the structural problem and the economic base, uh, but we do not have a programmatic solution either in the form of some kind of top-down solution, such as the FDR approach, uh, or the 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 Stalinist model of centrally planned economy, those those, those two uh, tricks are gone, and people are grasping and groping around for alternatives, and they're not being very successful in in, in coming up with them. We th this is why I think we have a lot of romanticism either. For you know FDR style Fordism, or for uh, social democracy, you know, social democracy, or or even for uh, Soviet style communism in some <clears throat> quarters, and the reason is 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 because we're at a crisis point, and people don't really know how to deal with it, and we see this in a lot of countries where you have deeply unpopular governments who are enacting policies that people are bitter and angry about, yet. There is no concrete opposition that can alt that can offer an alternative vision. We look at America, people elected Biden. By and large, Biden is continuing similar policies to what a Republican administration would do. We look at Britain, we see 
the Labour Party doesn't really offer a significantly different policy. You go to places like Turkey or India as well. Again, there is an opposition movement, but the entire politics is focused around cultural and symbolic issues, as well as significant issues related to, let's say, personal freedoms and social uh, liberation. But no one is has re does really has a programmatic tra uh, challenge to um, you know to to the existing economic uh, order of things. You go to India and you see the Communist Party in India is basically you know calling for kind of a little bit more social democracy, except with Marxist terminology. Right, so we don't we we we're at a kind of political crisis because we don't have a political movement with an alternative vision to the existing uh, political order, and the ruling classes seem to have completely run out of tricks up their sleeve. Maybe they can gr mitigate this by you know playing on nationalism or playing on cultural issues, but one wonders how long uh, that type of polarization can last. Marcus, you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, and that's where I think um, t towards that end of like the fearful thing for me is that like this largely ends up in like, well, let's just go to war, right? And that's <laughs> it's a it's always a uh, that 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 card that um, any president in the U.S. and the and can pull out, and I think that this is a kind of like the concerning thing is that. There's a lot of all of the problems <laughs> that we've been talking about are being shifted and off to, well, this is because of Russia or this is because of China, um, which has been going on for quite some time, you know, like, but, you know, there's the fears of, oh, hey, China's going to overtake us. You know, Russia is always the, you know, big, scary communists that are going to destroy the world or whatever the fuck. But now there are material, you know, problems that people have that the administration is saying. The, remember when we warned you about Russia? This is this is Putin's price hike. Oh, now all the jobs, like all the jobs that like you can't like don't have, you know being able to pay you know like, enough to, to to live. Oh, well, it's because China is taking this industry from us. And it's like when Joe Biden, you know, who is <laughs> helped handcraft NAFTA himself, is there saying, oh, these are the countries that 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 took these jobs, or these are the countries that are raising these prices? It's only giving the American people you know, the, the the fervor necessary to then, you know, we got to go to war, you know, and that's that's how most president, or at least like that's how presidents can say, don't look over here, don't worry about the fact that you can't pay for shit. You need to sacrifice for the greater good, the effort across overseas. So Marcus, are you proposing the conspiracy theory that Joe Biden is trying to get us to trickle into a major European military conflagration to it's, save neoliberal capitalism in the 21st century? Is I would say I would say that it's not just Joe Biden. This is just where the the lobbying and the military industrial complex will end up getting us to but right? wars aren't not... fought the same way they are anymore and they don't necessarily come out being profitable in the end anymore either if that was the case how come we're not in a major boom after 20 years of the war on terror well profitable for who i uh, i mean, i'm gonna i'm gonna be the anti-populist here and interject because i i think there is a sense in which a, a a Cold War boondoggle is, is exactly what you would want, uh, which is why they're totally okay with shipping uh, weapons to turn Ukraine into a bloody battlefield and sacrificing Ukraine on the altar of everyone's uh, austerity calls. Um, I actually totally see that, and that's also what we did in the Middle East. What I like to point out, however, that the profitability of the U.S., after World War II, in a broad spectrum sense, was only possible because it did not actually lose its co productive capacity and was able to rebuild European productive capacity while also extracting massive amounts of raw resources from Latin America. It actually kind of left Africa alone, believe it or not. Uh, that was more Europe's shit. But um, that, that 
is a unique thing. It's something that no other state can do because what happened afterwards is the nuclear bomb makes that calculation impossible. You are looking at a mass extinction event within a course of a year for human beings if there is a direct great powers war. So th this is this is me being like, you know, for I, I I'm a I'm a I'm a Bukharanist on on imperialism, you know, that's who Lenin was really basing a lot of his stuff on. Um, but Kalski was right in the sense that once the 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 destructive capacity of a war exceeded removing the excess population and exceeded removing overproduction, that there would be intercapitalist uh, detente in general um, between capitalist powers. And the, the 20th century, both because of fear of the Soviet Union and then later the fear of nuclear war, has more or less proven that true with the exception of proxy wars. And there's not any proxy wars left because the one thing the multipolarity people are completely right about is that the fragility of these proxy wars no longer just affects U.S. spheres of influence. And so places like Russia, who, let's be honest, has massive resource capacity, uh, massive food capacity, but has very little non-military productive capacity because of decisions made after Khrushchev and the Soviet Union that were maintained during the oligarchical period under Yeltsin, um, uh, have, they have not shifted from that. And so there is not a productive counterforce other than, other frankly, than China. But China needs the U.S. as a buyer for its production. It needs... It, it, Russia cannot replace that, by the way. Just from sheer population differences, Russia can't replace that. Even if you had an enclosed super MMT, because I've seen people like Michael Hudson and James K. Browgrave wrote this stuff and not look at the population different sizes. All right. Um, the China knows that this order is coming to an end. All right. Uh, everybody knows this order is coming to an end. Our military knows this order is coming to an end. Um, and I think you're right, uh, Marcus, that military contractors have the primary benefit of this shit this entire time, which is which is fundamentally different. And it's why it was so hard to get out of Afghanistan. It's why everyone's been promoting this weird proxy war bullshit in Syria. Um, but the problem now with Ukraine is made it obvious is now you are going to be dealing with opposed nuclear powers. Who are at direct material odds with one another and this doesn't just this is not just the u.s and russia and maybe china trying to broker between the two honestly it's also india who is siding with russia on the ukraine issue but against china on every other issue including joining with the quad and trying to cut off chinese trade what what i think we are looking at is I think people's natural resources and the way that you would sure up this is, is a war. But now the only people who can have a war are the nuclear powers themselves. That's the only people left. They can't just hide it in proxy wars anymore. So they can't do much. And you see, if, if you actually read military policy papers, and I, I, I read everything, so I do, the top brass is like spinning Circles trying to figure out how to frame this because they want a conflict, but they don't want a direct one. Because everybody knows if you start having nuclear bombs flying, we're all dead. Like, so well, let's, take this, let's take this to what initially brought us to this conversation. We kind of circumvented talking about it directly. Sanders. <laughs> Is the response in the presidential election of 2024, since we've already Acknowledge that 2022 is kind of a wash for the Democrats, for the Democrats or for the progressives to run Bernie Sanders, as well, uh, this Jacobin argument, our, our article and argument is making. I would I would begin by saying um, I think it's likely that Biden will run again. But even if he does not run again, the likelihood of Sanders being able to take the nomination and even the desirability of having, what, an 82-year-old uh, man in the White House 
with virtually no congressional support, if he were by some miracle to win, is, um, you know, is questionable. I think, in my opinion, uh, the idea of running Sanders in 2024 is a symptom of the fact that the social democratic left that grew up under the Sanders, uh, it, it, within the Sanders movement, or that attached itself to the Sanders movement, has come to a kind of political impasse. I think they're out of ideas. I think the strategy, uh, which was, I think, was a perfectly reasonable strategy and still was, was that perhaps Sanders, we could parlay off Sanders, a, a stronger social democratic congressional base, more power at the local level to engaging in, in, in electoral politics, and this would take uh, a, this would take shape under the umbrella of a Sanders movement. As uh, Adolf Reed has pointed out, you know the Sanders campaign was an organizing opportunity. Now, what we have seen, especially since 2020, is the failure of the Sanders movement, and part of this is down to Sanders himself to transform the enthusiasm that many people had for Th Sanders' presidential bid into concrete uh, political gains. There have been some gains in some places. There's no doubt about that. There are now at least people in the Congress who uh, lay claim to the title of socialist. But nowhere near, there is no, number one, that sort of left wing of the Democratic Party uh, is extremely weak. And not only that, the external forces such as the DSA, which one would hope would be able to discipline those that left wing of the Democratic Party, has proved incapable of disciplining that uh, uh, wing of the Democratic Party. So when we look at the you know DSA mm -hmm. and the ecosystem of DSA um, media, which I wouldn't say DS, uh, Jacobin is literally an organ of DSA, but I would certainly say that it's an ally ideologically aligned uh, publication. I think they themselves are perhaps out of ideas, at least when it comes to electoral politics, because the electoral strategy that was driven forward for the last uh, six years has, although having some gains, has not made the gains necessary to make a left-wing presidential run, you know, feasible. And frankly, if we're talking about electoral politics, it would be a far wiser strategy to run someone younger who can at least run several times to build up that support than run uh, a Bernie Sanders on death's doorstep. So I do not see, I think... I think on the face of it, it's a bad idea because even if you're trying to run a messaging or organizing campaign you uh, through a left-wing candidate, Sanders is just too old and the left has to stop being so dependent on Bernie Sanders because he's not going to be around uh, forever. But on a broader level, perhaps we might be at the point where we need to uh, expend political energy and not uh, on different types of political activity, perhaps more local government activity, perhaps more, um, you know, uh, extra parliamentary activity in, ter in terms of uh, civil society and trade union organizing. Perhaps that is a better way to expend political energy than diverting it into what will be a failed presidential campaign. And frankly, if you think Bernie Sanders even has a shot of winning a nomination, I think you're political judgment needs to be called into question. I think it was perfectly reasonable in 2016. It was perfectly reasonable in 2020 to take that approach. It. Sectarian naysayers will, they do say everything. So when it doesn't work out, uh, you know, they can say, well, I told you it wouldn't work out. But at least there was a kind of viability to the strategy, which now we need to cut while we're, uh, you know, we need to cut well ahead and really consider taking new approaches to do political activity because I think the risks of another Sanders movement is that it will lead to more cynicism and demoralization on the part of the left and that will outweigh any potential benefit to organizing or what have you. I think 
I think one thing you can say about the Sanders movement is that, look, it gave a generation of people at least a concrete taste of organizing and campaigning. Like a generation that had been utterly depoliticized. They picked up concrete skills, which I think are important. They People were politicized. People were exposed to the issues. People were pushed to the left. And I think that's all positive. But I think we've come to the end of the road of that particular, the Bernie train has come into the station. And if you want to drive the Bernie train any for, further, you're driving it into the river. I'm, I'm going to be probably more generous than people would expect me to be. I think that I've said this before, so maybe some people who listen will say I'm being consistent. I think that the net effect of the Bernie Sanders phenomenon in introducing a significant segment of the American body politic to left of center policy, politics, and worldview was a good thing. The fact that we have this podcast is a limited political fruit. I agree. But the fact that people are interested in the conversations we have on this podcast is more valuable to me than just the podcast itself. The, in other words, the fact that we have working class people, even some who are above working class in terms of their social class status, who are interested in in finding solutions to the problems of capitalism rooted in political economy is a plus. And I think it's fair to say to th that that phenomenon is definitely partly a consequence of the Sanders rise. And I don't begrudge Sanders for having that cause. But where I think Gene is absolutely spot on is as in his analysis is that atmospherics alone is not politics. Creating an atmosphere for discourse, as good as the discourse may be, is not politics. And there has been a problem in translating the Sanders atmospherics into real politics. And what frustrates me, and you guys can talk me off this ledge if you think that I'm going the wrong way. I don't believe it had to be this way. And I got into a bit of an argument with Adolf about this because Adolf was like, I can't be George Sanders. I think Sanders couldn't do anything more than what he did. I don't agree with that. After 2016, after 2020, Bernie Sanders shut his operation down. Why did he do that? Because the campaign was over. I and mean, this is I, though, this is the thing, though, right? Is that there wasn't any, there was no organizational creation within the Bernie, Bernie Sanders campaign. He wasn't trying to make the Socialist Party in the United States. He wasn't even trying to create an organization. You had an offshoot. Which, he was trying to get elected. It was a it was a it was a political campaign for an office that used a lot of of organizing rhetoric to get people to mobilize for the th for this you know one this one fucking uh one fucking uh spot. But that's something that's. I think it's kind of on the organizers. It's on the rest of the people who say, I agree with this ideology. How do we ride in this way? And, and, and that's like, I mean, that's what it, is. it was. A, it was a, it was a campaign for presidency. And I'm when it, when it lost, they, they pulled the plug on it. Can I say well, something about well, that? I want to ask a question. And okay. two Maybe this question. Mm -hmm. Is it wrong for us to have expected Bernie Sanders to build the left that he needed to see his agenda through? No. Um, I feel like that's kind of an expectation he set, but it might have been wrong for us to believe that he could do it. He would say, not me, us, all the time, and I still don't think people knew what that meant. Uh, I was a volunteer for his campaign, and I can tell you towards the end, he was pushing for Amazon workers and Walmart, all these other people, all these other you know, 
groups that wanted better COVID protections and all of this. And we were met with waves of vitriol from people who were like, look, you need to just shut it down and let's move on. They wanted to see that kind of, I don't know, unity. So he was definitely pressured. I would have liked to have seen something of that apparatus still be in place. Yeah, I would have liked to have seen that. Vaughn, what are your thoughts? Look, um, I uh, am the odd person out here because I thought Bernie represented a positive change in American politics, sincerely, both in 2016 and in 2020, but that I thought the entire strategy after 2016 was wrong. Um, and the reason why I thought it was wrong is that... <sighs> Um, there were a focus on new, 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 but in the context of the Democratic Party, the already existing business unions, um, uh, hybrids of incoherent, different, and opposed visions of what socialist organizations would like. And I, I'm not a person who believes that you have we had to have all that straightened out beforehand because that would never happen. It didn't even happen with Bolsheviks. It definitely wasn't going to happen in a place like the United States. But what I was worried about is what happened. The, the, the tendency to invest in figures and to loyalty to figures is not just a problem on the left. It is a problem on the entire U.S. political spectrum because of the nature of the imperial presidency. Um, but it has led to people not being able to see how little the effect is. I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Um, Trump did not actually alter that much Republican policy outside of a complete reversal on tariffs, which, which was significant, and actually decreasing uh, the kinds of war profiteerings that he was willing to do. He was willing to risk war with Iran. So I don't want people, when people say, like, you hire these people who imply that he was a peace candidate, that's nonsense. Um, but he was, it was a marked change from the neoconservative consensus of the aughts and the late 90s in the Republican base. That is true. Um, what, what Trump did though, was Bannonism, for example, was a, was a weird, but actually a political, political philosophy. And as soon as he got into power, he threw them out. Now he's taking them back in now, but we got to remember he put, you know, he put neoconservatives back in charge, like John Bolton, my God. Um, so my point was, even with that, they did not change the structure of the Republican Party enough for there to be a coherent counter systemic movement in the GOP itself, despite uh, opposition to rhinos, despite what we've now seen with cultural politics. Um, and I think when you look at what we've done on the left, we haven't even done that. Uh, one of the things I, I, there, there has a rightful understanding of turn against localism because of the localist effects of the nineties and early aughts during the alter globalization movement. Right. We, we, younger people don't remember this, but this, this was my entry into the left and my exit from the left for a long time, honestly. Um, uh, but we have done stuff like miss that, uh, people will make the Reagan comparison. It's made in the article, but miss that Reagan actually didn't start that. He was not the first figurehead. That was Goldwater. Uh, and that there is a massive grassroots effort, both with a part with a group that literally ran like a like an anti-Leninist Leninist cult, the Bircher Society. I mean, they they literally had vanguard rules, like they read, um, uh, Marxist Leninist pamphlets and decided to organize themselves that way. <laughs> so, so, uh, you know, to fight communist. Um, uh, and that was all in the background for two decades before Reagan was able to come to power and consolidate that. All right. Um, 
we didn't do that. We kind of did it in New York and California uh, with the the DSA's local initiatives there. But the DSA, as soon as it started hitting some hard roads and some losses on its initial bid into red states in the 2018, immediately backed off on that. Immediately. All right. Um, uh, for everybody's looking at what uh, at what these uh, Trumpists are willing to do. I mean, one of the things that they are willing to do that that our side has never been willing to do is to take a temporary loss for a long term gain to get rid of their enemies within their own ranks and to run locally. We have never been willing to do that. Bernie also has not been willing to do that since 2016. He was willing to do it on his way up. All right. He was able to turn Vermont um, from a from a main style GOP stronghold to to the People's Republic of Dem Vermont um, by doing that in Vermont. But he has never been willing to do it at the national level. And there's. I, 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 we shouldn't just blame Bernie for this. We should blame all of our leaders because during this time period in 2019 is when Bashkar Shankara and unlike other people, I'm one like I'm not. I don't care about if people like me or think I'm non-sectarian. Uh, we're calling for a popular front led by social democrats and progressives. They call for it explicitly. All right, uh, not a united front, which is a different thing, and I want to go into the fine points of the differences. Uh, and that's not just a Trotskyist uh, versus ML difference. It's actually a difference that goes back to um, positions in the early third international. But they were calling for that. All right. And that's what we got. The, the, the idea that we would defend Biden so that we could have the space within the Democratic Party to get people like the squad up as the Bernie Sanders successors, but that absolutely did not happen. And that is why we're not talking about AOC or Ilhan Omar, whose politics are way better than AOC's, frankly. Um, uh, as but who can't be president. Right. Who can't be right. 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 Um, but, but as a natural successor, nor anybody in a state level who got high enough to say be a a major as mayor of a major city or any of that as a natural successor either. And unfortunately the squad immediately got folded into the progressive caucus and the progressive caucus immediately got folded into um, uh, the, the DNC uh, unequivocally. And unfortunately the people who pointed this out have been trying to do a popular front strategy with elements of the right. So we don't have, like, you know, when, when I would when I would bring some of this up to Harvey K, you know what he would say to me? Are you a Jimmy Dore fan? <laughs> uh, no, and that's, like, here's what, going back to Bernie, and as far as should there be a third run, would it be good and or bad? Gene, I think I agree a lot of the points. Um, the only thing, though, is, like, who who would be the alternative, you know? Um, that's something that, you know, would have to, in, in if there's going to be an alternative, like it's kind of, I don't know, maybe too late. <laughs> um, Sometimes if you didn't hit the gym and work out, don't go to the boxing ring because you're going to get punched out and damaged worse than you were before. You know, like perhaps we haven't done the work we need on the left to be able to play the electoral politics game on the presidential level. I mean, I am yeah. not. I, I'm I not, I'm not, um, um, you know, I'm willing to be persuaded on a lot of things. And, you know, again, I generally think that in 2016 and uh, in 2020, having a left voice introducing people to ideas on the left uh, was an important thing. But we're at a point where we will now, by, if we fold into the Democratic Party, 
we compromise left-wing politics. And this is obviously the bigger problem with the two-party system, although this problem exists in other countries. But with the fact that all politics is bourgeois politics in the United States, we end up being siloed. There is no independent working class or socialist politics. Therefore, we end up being siloed either into the Democratic Party or into the Republican Party. And you have, of course, renegade elements that will become Republicans and who may raise legitimate uh, criticisms. I mean, I think one of the reasons why people get mad at some of these post-leftist people who end up becoming functional Republicans or actual Republicans is that sometimes their criticism hurts because there's an element of truth to it. Because it's true because you... we because we become compromised by the Democratic Party. Now, on the flip side, I'm not completely emotional about the Democratic Party where it's like, oh, how could you ever run as a Democrat? Look, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a the, the way the American electoral system is, there is very good cases to run as a Democrat uh, in certain situations due to access with the ballot and things like that. But that is a side point because that distracts us from what the real problem is, which is not people running as Democrats or people running on Democrat lines or people running in Democratic Party primaries, but becoming compromised once they enter into uh, politics. The, you know, what is the benefit of, uh, for example, uh, members of the, uh, the left wing of the Democratic Party who came to power with the support of the left voting? For war money, right? Uh, you know, I, I what is the, the what it compromises them? I think and, there's and, conditions where, where if Bernie was going to do another run, there are, I think there are conditions that was that would allow me to say yes, this is a good thing. This is a different and and going back to what is the actual run for? Because there's a lot of not you know the, the oh not me us talk and rhetoric and type of stuff. Part of that is like. It's also not just Bernie. There need, you know, and he said, hey, if we get elected, there needs to be a mass movement of people to get any of this stuff even close to being elected. That's the thing that wasn't there, right? So, like, Bernie lost, and there also was not any mass movement of people demanding that some things change within within the United States. The strategy that's, failed. The strategy well, that's where, failed. that's where, you know, I've said this before. It's like, if there was going to be some type of, you know, national uh, campaign, there needs to also be a directed goal to actually continue the work and at least even go for it and not just saying, Hey, we're knocking doors for one, you know, one campaign anymore. As soon as Bernie pulls out that campaign office is still, it should still stand. And that's from which people work to get people housing or food secure. You know, that, that needs to be, they need to actually plant the seeds, you know, so that things can grow, not just planting ideas, right? And, and so that's where I would support a yeah. Bernie run if there's actually a legitimate fucking organizational effort to make physical structures to that can be beacons in all the communities. If you're doing that, cool. But yeah, I agree. If it's just going to be another, hey, let's go out and get some that? fucking band that played 60 years ago to come out and get some people out to some, you know, like that's just not going to be it. It's just going to be the same thing. And I do, it's going to be, you know, it's going to make Varn even more of a sad guy. Why is it that we we don't realize, listen, we can't be the only people that are realizing that there's a lack of organizing around politics that we need going on with these left of progressive issues. It's transparent. You know, you know, I'm working on a piece right now talking about why is mass politics working for the right? People are saying mass politics doesn't work anymore. Vaughn and I were talking yesterday about how, listen, the right is having picnics in your hood with the brothers around the way, yep. and they come in there to get that barbecue talking about, yeah, let me hear what you're talking about. Latinos in Texas are going to right-wing functions listening yep. to what these guys are talking about. If mass politics doesn't work, if organizing politics doesn't work, if mobilizing politics doesn't work, why are conservatives able to have social functions where they can get bodies of bodies of people to come out and react to their politics in a way that's favorable to them? Is it because they have more money? That's part of it, but it's I mean, but we have to look at their structural limitations and how they're still doing it. I've been pointing this out for a long time. Like we we did like we um, the the progressive elite that is turning on Biden now, Bezos, 
uh, all the all the social media giants did way down to stop fascist creep uh, and censor uh, the conservatives. And I, I'm going to tell you, it didn't fucking work. There, they grew, not shrank. But now we don't know where they are and who exactly they are because they're not entirely visible on social media. So this. And, and we were looking at the wrong people. Everybody was was focused on uh, Richard Spencer. Like now, okay, I'll talk about my background. You want to talk about sketchy people I know? All right, I know Richard Spencer. Um, like I know him from when he was the culture critic at Amcom, and I was coming up uh, be, working on anti-war work. Uh, with with antiwar.com and actually it was the encounter of people like him and MPI that scared me away from that in 2005 all right very early um because I realized oh there really are Nazis here right and they were they were quieter about it back then um but here's the issue they were always the wrong people to be looking at Adrian uh Vermeule uh Patrick Deneen um the Claremont Institute, the uh, a lot of people who take Peter Thiel money explicitly, uh, American Affairs magazines, these people have been building an outreach network. They've been taking over dissident groups of previously opposed kinds of conservatives, all right, through through Mercer money. And my friends, I don't want to make you paranoid. They've also been paying for Marxist articles to peel off people getting critical of their prior buyer's remorse with the Democrats and to settle petty scores about identity politics, right? When Adolf Weed said, Nagel got got, well, there's going to be a whole lot more people getting got. And I don't think people want to look at this. By the way, there's a lot of pushes on people that we should run socially more conservative people. That will never work for the left because if you run socially conservative people, they just vote for fucking social conservatives who are better at it and are honest. And by the way, that's been historically true too. Um, when people, like when Debs, for example, read the ran the party and the SPA and the SPA had so much success, uh, um, the they would sometimes not weigh in on social issues, all right? But he did not support conservative factions even within his own party movement. Um, and there were a lot of them in, in the SPA. We, we've already talked about this. Like, But uh, com conversely, broaderism in the uh, CPUSA uh, was a disaster, right? It didn't work. Um, social patriotism during the popular front period was really when the CPA USA set itself to get purged very quickly in the 1950s. It was almost a collaborator in its own purging during the during the second second, really the sixth in my counting Red Scare. Um, so I think both tendencies right now are wrong. What you have to do, and I think Pasco, you've been speaking very wisely about this, is go to where the people are and be honest about who you are, what you believe, what our values are, how we can help them, and how we're not going to, like, necessarily, we're not out to crush their way of life. Like, we're not, okay? Like, I'm not, I don't really care if people go to church. I don't really care about their faith. Like, I'm not, you know, I, in fact, if anything, studying the Soviet Union, uh, the attempt to eradicate the Orthodox Church put it in a really good position to be a hyper-reactionary power and a major power player in Russia as soon as the Soviet Union fell. Um, so whereas in Czechoslovakia, where they took a much lighter hand, it's still secular. Um, even now, you know, almost a generation after the, after the communists are gone. So I, I think we needed to go out and do that outreach, but it requires people who are comfortable talking to the kinds of people leftists aren't used to talk, talking to, but it doesn't mean you like pretend to be a conservative. Right. Um, 
And I, I don't I don't want a red brown scare because I think a lot of liberals are actually have actually been using red brown scares to come down on the left. Uh, totally. They really are. I mean, the fucking State Department's been encouraging it even. Um, but what I will say is that historically speaking, when leftists have tried to pivot to social conservatives, we become the intellectual heads of the fascist movement. We that happened in the 1920s and 30s. That is undeniable. And there is a long examples of this in other countries. If you look at uh, if you look at Turkey today, many of the nationalists supporting uh, Erdogan, you know, some of the key, key figures are ex Maoists. Right, mm -hmm. who who found a common ground in anti-imperialism to back them up. Uh, under the Shah, there were leftists who basically came to support both the uh, Shah and then later the Islamic Republic. So you know we don't end up uh, changing the conservatives. The conservatives end up changing uh, us. the left. Uh, us, yeah. You end up being liquidated into a reactionary movement. And, you know, I say, you know, I don't want to name names, but I, I, I know someone who styles themselves a leftist, but it nowadays just spends all their time basically doing soft propaganda in, in, in the English language for the Erdogan government. And, you know, this is not just something that can just happen in somewhere like Turkey, but that's something we see here in the United States where you have people who are now using Marxian language in order to justify reactionary uh, politics. So I completely agree with Bond that we should never capitulate to the right on social issues. I think the critical thing is to pick the battles. I mean, we had Anton Yeager on here talking about the era of hyperpolitics, where everything is politicized. And what that means is a lot of people's political bandwidth gets dragged into cultural war issues, which they're not necessarily unimportant issues, but they become a kind of a rabbit hole where all political energy become, comes to be directed and we don't have any space to discuss anything else. So we are talking about specific issues relating to identity politics when we should be uh, directing our focus to other types of politics. We're basically choosing to fight political battles on the right's ground because they bait leftists. And in particular, because of the, let's just say, you know, uh, middle class, upper middle class, e uh, graduate educated Elon of many leftists who are, you know, extremely culturally liberal, they are, uh, and who often are the, let's just say, the spokespeople uh, of the left, even if they aren't elected, those people get baited into these cultural war issues, and the right is able to make hay out of them and make people look crazy, right? Uh, and, and, and you know, play a disingenuous game. But we are fighting on that terrain. Uh, we're fighting the cultural war. Um, uh, you know, I often give the example. It's like the right wants to talk about trans women in sport all the time. It's like this is a very, very freaking niche issue. If we're going to discuss trans issues, we need to be moving that onto the issue of healthcare and the broader issues connected to healthcare connected to the working class issues uh, related to safety, including the safety of uh, sex work, trans sex workers, rather than a niche middle class issue where, you know, pe normal pe you know, people who don't know too much, they will see uh, uh, Leah, uh, the Leah Phillips, is it? The swimmer, a uh, very tall person uh, beating all these uh, people in a race. And they're like, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. And thus we're reducing a very important issue of social liberation to a very specific boutique issue. When in fact, the vast majority of trans people, what are they suffering from? A lack of access to healthcare, a lack of as uh, access to jobs, uh, uh, as well as of obviously the issues of social uh, inclusion and things like that. But, you know, worrying about swimming is not probably what 90% of trans people are worrying about. Does that make sense? I think that what Gene is saying, and you know, and what I agree with is that we should look at these issues from a perspective of political economy as opposed to culture. 
and try to understand well what exactly is the material incentive for trying to dissuade people from not being able to live a certain lifestyle how does this affect people's material quality of life what exactly are the policy considerations behind this as opposed to talking about you know cultural fears and paranoia and this and that and trying to separate or divorce emotionally charged reaction from the discourse because it seems like everyone is so paranoid and afraid and this and that and it's like let's calm down and try to figure out what exactly is the political economy behind what these policies are and see if you know let's address them from that perspective also happy pride happy pride, happy month. pride. Yeah. um yeah. that's something that and I, I i agree right and like this is more it's like i guess too it's like rhetorical stuff you know how do you actually have conversations with people and f drive it and focus it but also too it's like this grander strategy of what would a leftist organization that actually does have some type of political power you know like what do you go after um and yeah that's exactly the point you know and and then this because even with the, like Chappelle and then you got Ricky Gervais and all this type of thing where they're not actually really touching on like what matters at all, you know, which, you know, like, like you said, what, what's actual, you know, especially like trans youth um, and mental health, suicide rates, you know, like all these things, like, are we actually discussing what is affecting, you know, the queer community or are we just dealing with, you know, going from RuPaul's drag race to, you know, the end, other end of the spectrum, and, and the, and Hill, the, the know, reactionaries whatever. will take will uh, you know on the trans issue. The reactionaries will take us in a very reactionary direction if we fight the terrain on their ground. Look how fast it went from trans people in trans uh, and it's it's trans women that they that they're, they're, they're usually attacking, not trans men so much, but trans women in sports to let's get the police and arrest people who are dealing with trans children like they went from sports to like wanting to like take kids away from their parents because their parents are accepting of their uh, gender identity now i don't pretend to know uh like so much about the medical recommendations or the medical science behind uh, uh transgender issues but i do know that many on the political right in fact, most on the political life are not engaging this with this question on the basis of caring about the children, but are using it either opportunist opportunistically for political gain, that's certainly what political elites are doing, or are just playing out their own uninformed bigotry and suspicions uh, and projecting them onto, uh, onto people who are already quite marginalized and have a difficult time so i think this is like so we need to stop fighting these cultural wars on the rights terrain and we need to be focusing on issues that bring all these groups together and that promote solidarity and do not immediately alienate people who are not perhaps super informed on particular issues well i can i, I Go ahead, M. Toussaint, please continue. Okay. Um, I think there are actually plenty of opportunities to reach out to the LBGT plus community on economic terms. Obviously, healthcare is very, very important, but so is housing. Um, a lot of LGBT teens are kicked out of their homes very young. Um, and older folks who are in the community have trouble with housing as well because are you really going to go to a senior center with older bigots and just blend in like it's nothing? So they have serious housing concerns as well. And I think a lot of things have been framed and boiled down to gay marriage. That was a big goal for a long mm -hmm. time. I don't know anyone who cared about that because as a young person, my friends were getting kicked out of their homes and having to become sex workers in order to just live. So yeah, a lot a lot of this has been framed around um, bourgeois concerns. Yeah, it's, it's middle class issues. It's like, yeah. you know, 
it, it, it's like, and this is the same thing that Pascal always says about black politics, that black politics comes to be framed around the issues of the black middle class and not about around the issues that affect the vast majority of poor and working class black people. And we see the same thing in the uh, uh, in the gay LGBTQ plus community. We see, you know, a lot of the debate takes place uh, uh, around uh, issues which are, you know, of, of course, they're important issues for uh, to be considered, but are primarily of concern to those who are in the middle or upper class. Right. Um, having, being able to see your loved one, being allowed to do certain things with your insurance, seeing them in the hospital, that sort of thing. You can do that and you can be concerned about that if you have health insurance. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you don't have health insurance, you don't need the permission to go to the hospital, right? right? So yeah, we 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 have to we have to be able to tackle these issues, and we have to be able to be uh, strategic. And I fear, at the moment, we're in the moment of defeat. And you know, I think uh, it's fine. We have to accept that. That's okay. You know, like we don't need. We shouldn't be like uh, down beaten by it. But you know, we don't want to get sucked into. Uh, 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 cultural war issues, which so why don't we, we just spend thirty minutes? I mean, okay, um, I, I'm in trouble going, now. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm actually more than a little bit. Go, uh, go, go. Um, even talking about it this way concedes the point, and I can see it from reactionaries in your chat. And by the way, you guys should be policing them and not arguing with them. Um, I'm, I'm all about free speech. Uh, people actually should know that about me. But I'm also about uh, when you have enemies amongst you, you take care of them. All right? You don't debate them. Um, this is a big issue because the other side uh, doesn't debate us. They take care of us, and they are. Now, um, maybe it's my experience in Egypt that makes me feel this way, but most of the leftists I know there are dead. All right? You know what that feels like. <laughs> All right. So, um, um, for, and because they, they, could, they kept on trying to triangulate, with elements of the Brotherhood, with elements of the Al Sisi government, I, I remember S S Samir Amin, a, a Marxist I respect, was like spinning himself in circles to figure out what he was going to do. Now he died of old age, but a lot of his comrades didn't. They died in a prison across the street from me. You are about to be in a situation where that is a reality for some of you, and I'm tired of us pretending that that's not the case. The shit in Texas should have indicated that to people. But you cannot argue that on either their grounds or the grounds of the Democratic Party. We often speak, move, and talk, even with nonverbal communication, in ways that signify class coding to people who do not have our social capital. And even the way we're talking about this conversation right now indicates that. You are not, I mean, yeah, we're amongst ourselves, but we're not code switching. For an outside audience, even the fact that I have to say that word, which is itself, admitting that word is a very coded elite word. All right. I'm not, we should absolutely not be conceding these points to the right. We should absolutely not be tolerating rightists in our midst. When the left has done that in the past, Giovanni Gentile, Michelle Robert, if you don't know who these people are, you should. All right? Um, and the reason why I care about this so much is I was one of the people who got conned by this shit the last time around. All right? As a person who came out of the blue-collar working class, and, and by the way, let's talk about the material conditions of the blue-collar working class. It's 13% of the population. Like all these people who think you're going to return to like this massive industrial worker thing, uh, that's not who the working class is materially. It's not. It's it's objectively not. Like, so 
that's over. Uh, until to until COVID, and this again, we're not really talking about. But until COVID, the working class was actually uh, the, the the statistically likelihood to be a single mother um, who flip a coin on whether or not they were of color. Right, right. That, now that actually ended with COVID, though, because childcare is so expensive that people have been opting out of work because it costs more to get childcare than to work. They are then to not work. So this has to, we have to change the way we're framing this. I care about trans issues. I absolutely do. When I talk to people who are not leftists, I do not talk to them this way, even the way we're talking right now. All right. Um, one of the things that Adolf Reed pointed out to me uh, uh, in an essay he wrote 10 years ago, that the framing that you use for things really damn matters. All right. And for the and for those who think you can concede to the right, uh, which was the AFL strategy in the 1920s, by the way, that's why the union movement was crushed in the South. It was objectively, because by ceding to the right, it meant that rich uh, people could always use desperate black people to break strikes. And you know what I'll give the the Communist Party during during uh, third periodism is they realized it was a problem. They were completely aware that if they didn't stop that, they would never be able to get any union penetration. It wasn't because people were feeling benevolent about like racial issues. It was because when you sidelined a certain group of people and and outed them and had no solidarity with them, they were always going to be able to be used to break strikes. They're always able to be used to get us tied up in cultural issues. And then when you try to play like, well, we got to provocate the conservative biases of this or that group, uh, you usually are actually playing into the right. Marx actually even writes about this, about like he understands why workers in Britain are anti-Irish. All right. Uh, Angela Nagel uh, quoted this, but then didn't quote the next part. Right. But if you tried to build a national polity that the workers in Britain were actually undercut themselves because they are now limited to the interest of their national policy and thus in line with their national bourgeoisie. This, and, and, and look, like when I talk to people at a church, I'm not going to throw these terms around, not because I think people are stupid, because that's another thing I get very frustrated about. A lot of people who tell you can't talk this way to, um, to working class people uh, imply that, that they think it's because they're dumb. All right. And a lot of them are like, you know, people like, well, we don't need our PNC values. I'm like, look, you need to change the way you talk. You need to change the way you code things. But it's not because people are stupid. All right. A lot of the people who push this anti PMC stuff are themselves PMC unequivocally. All right. Um, you will, you always hear me push back on this stuff because I'm, I am now, but I'm not from that background. Right. That's not where I come from. And so to, to really get with this, we have to be able to treat people and talk about these things honestly, but in a language that doesn't treat them as idiots, doesn't try to talk down to them, doesn't try to hide our thing. I'm like, oh, you're so stupid. You have to have conservative values because, I mean, like, let's let's be honest. Like, how many of you go to Target and see um, some blue-haired queer person stocking shelves? Like, like, come on. Um, and I also want to say that, like, for people who think this is not part of a bourgeois agenda, if it isn't part of a bourgeois agenda, why is someone funding it to massive amounts of money? Uh, um, Coulette magazine has never turned a profit. Never. All right. Somebody thinks this stuff, somebody rich and powerful thinks this stuff is important enough to lose money on it. Now, all right, so, you know, you hear me getting mad. I, I think, like, like I think we have to have a completely different way of framing all this. But we also have to have a different, a completely different way of approaching people and getting their feedback. We should not assume that, you know, all this is elite problems. Because it is true that in, uh, even in stuff like disability right now, all right. I think about autism activism and neurodivergence activism. You know who gets to represent that? Rich neurodivergent people at Harvard from the upper middle class. Right. And they're, they speak for everybody. It's the same kind of capture that we are well aware of in racial issues. 
all right? And unless we can speak to these problems without conceding and empowering these people, and these people will always have an advantage because we live in a world with divided labor, and because we live in a world of divided labor, there are skills gaps and knowledge gaps. That's a fact. We cannot pretend to wish it away. So we have to learn to change the way we talk. And you know what? Unfortunately, it, um, Bernie was actually one of the best examples of this in 2016, right? He did know how to address different groups without picking up reactionary talking points. But he got so much crap for this from a certain section of activists. Um, and then conversely, there was a counter response to those activists who were immediately telling him to pick up conservative talking points. All right. They became the core of the online post left. But isn't that what, what I isn't that though what I was saying though my my point was we have to recognize the class differences within identity groups without throwing uh, issues of social liberation under the bus right that I mean you can't you you we have to tie these to the broader material arguments. Well, well, listen, we're gonna, let's, 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 let's cut to the chase. Right? Let's 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 let's. Stop the smoke and mirrors and let's cut to the chase. When we're dealing with issues like trans issues, we fundamentally have communities energized by the right yep. who are going to start off a conversation with what is a woman? How do people like ourselves who are trying to be sensitive to the demand of people who are transitioning who are going through this process engage with this discourse without saying get the f out of my face you reactionary right one right wing right winger or 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 sounding like a complete clown by saying well a woman can be anything she wants to be because i want to tell you right now and i'll be called a transform a transform someone asked me well what's a woman i said a woman is a female adult as far as i know that's what i was that's what i was taught maybe i'm wrong Maybe I'm wrong. Is that I, mean I think to trans people. I'm not. I, but that that's kind of my point, though. It's like I, I, this is not the only issue where this is so fraught. But when we keep saying avoid the culture war, but we have to talk in in specific ways um, because of the needs of a certain of various communities. All right where we're not addressing a lot of the needs of most of the people in that community too, at the same time, by the well, way we are framing this in elite discourse, uh, there isn't, it's a trap basically to play the game at all. And unfortunately people are going to feel like you're erasing them if you're not playing the game. But this was, this was Adolf Fried's point back in the day about reparations. He would, he would say stuff like, well, reparations is always going to set, a group of people at odds with you because they're going to feel like that certain subgroups of white people who do not have inherited wealth are being punished for the white people who do. Um, and well, since they're going to get punished anyway, they might as well side up with the white people who do to fight them. Right. Reed spells that logic out clearly. Poll after poll after poll backs it up. All right. It was one of the most successful things in the eighties that they were able to freak people out about affirmative action, even though like the number one benefit of affirmative action was usually women and mostly white women. Um, uh, because of the framing. All right. Now, what you have to say is how do we protect people in your community who are vulnerable um, from people who want to tear your community apart? And, and that's what we see, like, that's what this Texas thing really indicates. And that's what we're talking about with the Texas, like, criminalizing, even helping. Like, this is aimed at dividing up families immediately. Yeah. And, and it's, you it's, it's also, yeah. it's also directed at showing it's, it's anti-solidaristic because it's so suspicion within communities because it's, it's outsourcing policing to the population and, and, and promoting snitching, right? That's what it comes down to. That's what, what it's all about breaking people's social bonds and using these issues to break people's uh, social bonds. I don't want to be misunderstood. When I say avoid the culture war, 
what I'm what I really mean, I guess I should concretize it is avoid fighting political issues on the grounds that the political right want you to fight them on. So you know how we won this battle in Utah and we did lose it the third round around, but you know how they run battles and like on transition bans and whatever is they actually did. Uh, the left was able to appeal here to um, actually mostly to Mormons on the issue of, do you really want to say that parents cannot make informed decisions about their children just to protect conservative values? And people like Mouse Witch do really want to say that, by the way. I mean, like, like the groomer stuff is also like, it, it's not going to, my other point is it's not going to stop with trans issues. Like we already see this with teachers. Like we're all being called groomers now. We're every, Every conservative is now implying that I'm a sexual assaulter, which, by the way, makes me want to shoot them. Like, that's my response to that. I want, like, my response to that is we no longer have any way to have discourse. The only recourse we can have is violence. Now, I also know that I would lose, so I don't do it, right? Like, there's no, um, and, I, and, I, and I don't think that's, a, that's not a healthy response, but they know what they're doing. Because if you get the rhetoric to that point, you cannot argue it anymore. And they have successively driven a wedge on anything that you could do. All right. And what you have to do is point out that these people are tearing your communities up. Like they are doing that. They are not just being anti-solidaristic. They are turning communities on themselves. And if you can do that, you might have the ability to flip some of these people who are temperamentally protective of their families and whatnot. And understandably so. Like, this is why this, like, NIMBY YIMBY stuff never goes anywhere either. Because, like, there's a reason why, why say, uh, uh, and I saw this when I was on community, uh, on community stuff here. And so, like, there's, re like, some of the people who were the most pro-cop were, were, um, <laughs> Uh, single mothers of color who have who were trying other things to handle the homeless issue when they did not work or were not addressed or not picked up at all, they're like, fine, just arrest them because they don't want my kids around heroin. Right? Like, we all know this happens. We know this happens. And yet we can't speak to it on a level. Now, what I found interesting is those same mothers of color tried to avoid that because they don't like cops. Like, like they're not they're, they're, this whole right, but you you see even figures like Glenn Lowry talking about like well oh you know groups of color are pro law and order and I'm I'm like they're pro order and if they don't get it from social from other social harmony if they don't get it from from social welfare policies removing the problem from community policies removing the problem they'll take it from force because they don't have any other choice now. I think the entire way we've been talking about this conversation, because Gene, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying like, even the way we're talking about this still sets it up in those terms. We are still trying to say, and Pascal's absolutely right. Like, like, um, I mean, one of the things that I've been attacked on the most for the longest time was being a transphobe because I misgendered someone who I knew as another gender in, 20, in 2013 while I was in another country and was not even completely aware of the cultural shift that had happened in America. All right. I am st I still get people on the very far left who will attack me over that one mistake once, despite the fact that I literally do a podcast with a trans person. Like, well, the, but that's a that's a problem for left political culture in and of itself as well, wouldn't you say? Because uh, everybody no e jumping on each other for honest mistakes and the completely unforgiving atmosphere that exists on the left is probably not helpful to winning people over and kick makes people conservatives, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, pro it's a, pro it's a project projection of powerlessness. Correct. I, I, I would. I, I, I will calm down and re recede to the rest of the panel after I tell the story. Vaughn, you're giving us great content, man. He's uh, a different question. Um, um, I worked with Mark Fisher way back in the day. I, I am the person with another 
uh, um, former communist who's now dead. Um, uh, the different story on that. Not one of the people died in Egypt before people assume that. To uh, to commission the Vampire Castle piece. All right. Um, and I also critique Mark Fisher for throwing the baby out with the bathwater and the way he set it up and for trying to defend milk toast social democracy and people like Russell Brand and uh, and a cultural notion of working class. But I, I published that. All right. I, I was brought into to defend the piece. We had a debate to defend the piece uh, uh, where I took uh, I mostly defended Fisher, but pointed out some of the issues I had with it. Um, I then uh, uh, commissioned articles from Sam Chris, now canceled, now writes the first things, uh, which is funny because he canceled uh, Fisher because of his association with Nick Land. Um, uh, a, a, a couple other Maoists uh, who, who, frankly, okay, this is how ugly it got, uh, informed on the British equivalent of family and child services on Fisher and then harassed his relationship with his kids. Um, uh, and then Jody Dean and Michael Rattenwald, and if people know that name, <laughs> uh, to defend Mark. Well, Michael, to, to, to try to play this out, I don't know what he was doing. He, he had some kind of... I'll be terrible. I actually am not going to his personal stuff because he's 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 less than happy and I'll leave that be. But there was some personal stuff going on in his life, and he did this thing, did this anti woke professor thing like before Trump was in at the end of the Obama administration. And then while he was writing a book with me, um writes an article talking about the religious nature of some of the identitarian stuff. And he publishes it in American Conservatives. Then two months later, he is one of the last guests on Bill O'Reilly. And then two months after that, he's threatening to sue any leftist he's ever published with uh, for defamation. And he's pushing far right, not just semi-right conspiracy stuff, um, uh, pushing anti-Jewish stuff, uh, um, while also writing books for, you know, for moderate right publications um, and, you know, going on Kuwait, this, that, and the other. Um, I, in his case, I don't think it was money that initiated it, right? It was the way we went about this cultural battle. And the other thing that happened um, is that the other guy who I published that article with at North Star Magazine, uh, which is no longer in existence, which is why it's hard to find the original. And uh, by the way, I think all reprints of that, if they if they were done, they weren't done with the permission of the magazine that published it. They may have been done with permission of the Fisher Estate, um, uh, which I happen to know for a fact because I was the editor. Um, he also became right wing because they saw the harassment Mark got, and then Mark killed himself. Now, I don't think the harassment is totally why he killed himself. There's a million. I'm not going to speculate on why a friend of mine takes his own life, but it did happen undeniably. All right. So what happens then? Well, that prompts a lot of people to cut right. And as soon as they start cutting right, you know what? You know what I discovered? They started getting paid and their position started to change. And um, I actually spoke about this with Michael Brooks in public at a conference from Jordan Peterson in 2018. Uh, we were actually debating Doug Lane, who was like, well, there's no problem with debating this right. We can convince them. And I'm like, Doug, once you start doing that, they're going to offer you money. And mm. you're not even going to realize how you're changing your position because it's just one step over, one more concession. We can help this. We can do that. We can... And then all of a sudden you see these big magazines that can pay leftists a lot of money that they're also paying with like Catholic integralist. And I want people to know what a Catholic integralist is. A Catholic integralist is explicitly someone from the non-racial fascist tradition. That is not, I don't throw the word fascist around lightly. I don't think a lot of Trumpists are fascist. I know I'm unpopular for saying that, but these people are, all right? And so what I saw in the Fisher case was these, these, these mutually 
constituted debates, which forced people to take sides. And when people tried to concede a little bit to the right, because they were A, getting demonized by elements of left-wing discourse, and B, because they thought maybe it would bring people on board, they didn't bring anyone new on board. They became a captive asset of the right and eventually just flipped sides. And that is what I saw over and over and over again. And my response to this was just like, we, we have to reframe the way we're talking about all these issues. Now, on, on trans issues, I don't know what to do at this point. All right. Because exactly what you're saying, biological essentialism is a way to reach out to to disenfranchise men in many communities from incels to black men who feel like they're that their that their black masculinity has been a point of target. Legitimately, I may add, since black men have always been uh, treated as potential predators in U.S. discourse um, to uh, um, to. Uh, Latino men who um, feel like that they can't provide for the, their children will not be able to provide for their families. And someone like Josh Hawley is going to come on and talk about masculinity and leftists are going to think he's talking about like big, rough, toxic masculinity, like manosphere shit. And what he's actually talking about is the ability of men to have families at all. And they're going to, they are already pushing like semi-materialist conspiracy theories out of this Catholic corner, that the reason why there's so much queer stuff amongst the youth is because they don't have any hope of ever raising families anyway. That's what they're pushing. Now, we have to counter that, and we can't counter that on the terms in which we are speaking right now. Like, and I, I really don't know how you counter it, because I can think of times where we've talked about, like, progressive family policy, right? Like, I'm not a person who even believes in the nuclear family. I'll, I will say that, like, for reasons that are complicated, I'm not going to an air right now. But, like, I know that if you make people feel like, you know, as a formerly married dude, if you make people feel like the only thing in their life that is not commodified should be commodified, um, and that, and because it is commodified, they're not going to ever have access and that they're going to be perpetually alone and that they have no future, literally. I can't think of I can't think of people who'd be willing to fight harder. I really can't. Like, and, and by the way, I mean they are the people who like randomly shoot up schools more than even the racial issue. That issue drives uh mass shooting over and over again. So what are we going to do about it? And, and the answer I've gotten is mostly nothing, right? Because we don't feel like we can talk about what it is like to promote, like what does it even mean on the left to promote a healthy manhood that isn't, that isn't dangerous to other people? I mean, when I talked to Cuba about this, he was talking about like the demonic male myth. And I'm like, well, that's never going to fucking work. Like if we really believe that. I have a response to that. Why are we interested in promoting anything but a better humanity? I say this a million times. If you are more interested in protecting being a good human being, you'll worry less and less about your manhood or your womanhood. Why aren't we more interested in, in promoting a good humanity? Be a better human being. Why are you so stuck on the trouble of your manhood or woman? If you if you work on being the best human being you work, you can be, your manhood and womanhood will fall in line. I uh, I would I would say I totally I, I think that's totally true. But then we also have to uh, allow people to feel like they could have not even families, just partners. Like it, yeah, I, this is for me. I think like this is. Listen, listen. I understand that you have schools of thought. You know, death to patriarchy or patri I get. Listen, people believe all kinds of things. I understand the oppressive nature of the way heteropatriarchy works in capitalism. I get that. I understand these arguments. There are also human beings who see a certain value in two heterosexual people coming together and forming a social unit called a family. There has been demonstration why that has demonstrated to show positive results in some circumstances for societies. I don't think we should have a zero-sum game attitude towards 
social building blocks that have existed for millennia within humanity simply because we've read the latest iteration of feminist gender studies or Marxist Marxist theory on family structure. I'm not saying we shouldn't have opinions. I think we should tread lightly and have a discourse rooted in humanity. Well, let me just jump in here, though, because I have a, you know, Vaughn raised a really important point, and uh, one of the things that pushes people to to the right is not just the gravitational pull of the right wing's money, but is also the culture that exists on the left, which is often very unforgiving and not very understanding towards people. And, you know, when we say tread light, you know, people might not all be in the same place on all the different cultural issues. But the whole point of inverted commas awareness, and I realize that term is, it, it, it is uh, problematic or controversial in itself, is not to prove one's superiority or credentials or virtue over another person, but it's supposed to be to help them learn and to help, you know, help explain to people why, hey, you know, maybe misgendering somebody is kind of a douche thing to do. Uh, maybe you should, like, not do it. Rather than saying, oh, you did this, therefore you have some kind of essential reactionary nature to you. Or you use a racially insensitive term, perhaps, or highlight or, 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 or you know, use a trope that perhaps is problematic rather than people using that against you in a way uh, to discredit you in your entirety, but rather ha have uh, used that as a basis for discussion. That's the kind of uh, conversation we need to be having on the left and not this hyper sectarianism. And we had sectarianism in the past, but it was, uh, you know, it was about ideological tendencies within the Marxist movement. Today we seem to have sectarianism over you know, who's using the appropriate terminology uh, at any particular time as cultural norms shift. I, yeah, go ahead, Marcus. Uh, I, I was going to say, uh, yeah, there's, I feel like there's just like different levels of this and like you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of overlap as far as like scenarios or, you know, because if you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with an old buddy from high school, you know, something like that, where... They could they could be saying things. It's a personal conversation, you know. Like you can have like there's a lot of different rhetoric, you know, whatever that you do to try and change that person's mind. That's different than people who are gonna you know turn on the fucking webcam and and speak on the internet like uh, the four of us here. That that that's also different from organiza organizational leaders who may be speaking in front of a different you know like in front of crowds. So some of this is kind of just like situational, you know. I don't know just good rhetorical fucking policies or whatever the hell. Um, but as far as like, what do, you know, the broad left, like go for like that. It's always going to be, or at least a, this is my opinion, right. It's going after the material conditions of the, the necessities of, of those material conditions. And then trying to change the system, you know, from capitalism to socialism, to something that can, they work for people. So if you are engaged in an activity that's just trying to get people fed, that principle should be who's hungriest. And certain communities, it's going to look different, right, On, as, as far as who is the hungriest. But that, you know, you can work, start there and go when it comes to any a, a, like, a, any other issue. There's just issues that may, afford, uh, may be uh, oppressing, you know, or... Uh, harming the black community or black men or black young men differently than old you know whether it comes to lgbtq there are things that 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 trans people go through that gay men don't go through right so how how are you addressing what are you going for but at the end of the day yeah it's, it is identity just bullshit to say oh hey i'm want to just liberate the lgbt community it's more so to say no there's there is a actual directive to get fucking people help and I'm sorry, Varn, if I'm using the wrong fucking thing. No, no, there's but, no, but like, uh, yeah. But like, no, I think like that's 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 the thing is like where you even get caught up too is like where they the other day it was like their different situations call for different rhetoric. But if we're looking for some type of mass mobilization type of thing, I mean, yeah, I guess I do agree with Pascal is that saying 
we need to go for humanity, but understanding all of the elements within a specific human being that may play on their fucking life to make it worse or better. Having that understanding, you know, I don't know where that's where that would be wrong. I, I don't that. disagree yeah. with that. I'm, I, I, listen, someone's asking me, do I understand that class is a fundamental element of society over time and all of this is a problem? Of course, I, I, I've been, if you've been watching me on this show, I understand all of that. What I'm saying is that just because I understand that, just because we understand that, doesn't mean that 99% of the people we have in our society are at the same place in terms of looking at reality. And what we have to understand as those of us who are on the left is that most people don't look at the world through the reality in the lens that we do. Most people do not look at the reality through the eyes of dialectical and historical materialism. They look at culture. They look at family. They look at church. They look at gender. They look at sexual orientation. They don't look at it through class, through conflict of power structures, of hierarchy. They do not. Okay, We do that, we do that because we've had a certain type of political education who makes us understand that the overall structures of society are motivated by those tensions. And what I'm saying is that you're not going to have your politics expanded unless you have a space where you can mm -hmm. take those people who we call normies, if you will, and explain to them why we look at the world this way. And it's not going to work effectively if their concerns about culture, family, manhood, womanhood, children, marriage, and all that other stuff are just thrown out the window and dismissed. We have to find an effective way to talk about these phenomena as human beings in a way in which we don't alienate them and we don't view them as a threat to our people either. So, yeah, so I mean, I think... <sighs> We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to change the way we talk about a lot of things. And one thing we're gonna have to change the way we talk about it is knowing to which group how we're going to communicate. One thing that I used to point out to people, right? Um, and a lot of middle class educated milieus, and look, me saying middle class educated milieu indicates I'm in a middle class educated milieu, right? But in those middle class educated milieus, it is a status of protection to be seen as an exception and a victim. And if people deny that, then we have to explain why are academics really the only people who ever pretend to be another race than what they are, right? Like, you don't see that in general society, but you sure as hell do see it amongst academics. So, like, it's it, scandal after scandal after scandal. Uh, and, you know, a lot of famous progressives have gotten away with it from World Churchill to, uh, War to Elizabeth Warren. But um, uh, I think we forget a lot of the times that... Uh, I don't think this has as much purchase with, with, with people as people think. I mean, Pascal, you and I have talked about this before, but like the, um, uh, and I actually probably want to get MS on this too, but like the experience, for example, of racial problems being the primary driver of society is actually something that shows up as you move up the class basis on both, on both white and, and people of color as being the primary concern. And I've always like, well, that makes perfect sense, right? Because for for elite people of color, it is the only real block in their life. Like is is uh inter-ethnic competition and inter uh, and competition with with both actually primarily white, but as soon as that's out of the way, each other, like uh let's let like how much like and like like uh, anti-blackness is to be used in the the terms that we see in certain uh, academic groups really is like competition between elite sectors of communities. Um, uh, uh, like I actually saw in Salt Lake, like the Latin community, like was really turning that turning against uh, the Haitian, Somalian, and Ethiopian community um, because um, they. <laughs> You know they weren't strategically large enough blocks, and you don't really understand Latin struggle and and and. Um, and I saw that amongst you know just co community organizers and small, you know, small things here in Salt Lake. And, and and for people who don't know me, I know you're probably like, how do I have time? I don't sleep. Um, 
uh, I'm probably going to die really young. Um, so on, like is an energy in the air, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the, lots of Von juice. <laughs> um, the the thing that I saw when working with certain groups here is as soon as uh Biden came into power, um, and just, I guess to tie this up with things, we're gonna really see because the because austerity is gonna make this a lot worse, and the Democrats are the people overseeing this austerity, right? But like there began to be fighting over who who has a legitimate claim to represent the POC interest in an area, and it wasn't aimed at white people. All right, it was aimed between different groups. And here in Salt Lake, the largest group is Latin, the and then the smaller groups are African immigrants. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of African Americans here. Um, there just aren't his, for historical reasons that are kind of obvious if you know the history of Mormons. Um, but you know, there are a lot of people of color here, and there was also a turn against phrases like BIPOC, right? Which we right. saw in the DSA as well. Um, because, you know, people were like, well, you know, yeah, we should care about indigenous rights, but like the indigenous are like less than 1% of the population now because the genocide was more or less effective if we're completely honest. Um, and, uh, and so, and what I find fascinating about this and Cuba can talk about this too, is like that Olympics of priority is actually used by like the military on how they assign grants. Right. So there's real material competition here over who gets increasingly scant resources from the government. And as interest rates go up and private resources go away. All right. That's going to get worse. And what what I think people are missing is the national conservatives in specific, like the people who basically have Richard Spencer's politics, but like, it's not for right nationalists. It's for every Christian nationalist or everyone who wants to call themselves an American or whatever. Um, the Adrian Vermeules, the, the Patrick Deneens, the, uh, the guy who writes for compact with Edwin Aponte, all these guys, like they realize that, that demographically, they were never going to win on white nationalism. And a lot of them weren't that na na kind of nationalist. They never were, right? They weren't, they weren't racialist either. So when they pivoted, um, early on, you saw this, the New York Times started writing about like white nationalist of color, which was ridiculous. This was ridiculous flaming. That is almost giving them exactly what they want, right? Because they are going to be speaking to these issues and they're going to be saying like, look, if we all just support Western civilization, Western civilization can accommodate you. The Catholic Church can accommodate you. Like, um, this is this is this is an important this is an important point. I think one of the reasons liberals are so inept at dealing with this, and here I'm not talking necessarily even about the leadership of the Democratic Party, but your suburban liberal, the type of person who has one of those yard signs that says this house believes all people are uh, uh, legal and blah, blah, blah. The, these kind of, the reason they are so unready to rise to the right-wing reactionary threat is that they're fighting a battle against racialists in, uh, at a time where the extreme right is deracializing. Now, of course, there is a racial and cultural nationalist component to, to that movement, you can't entirely exercise it. But increasingly, the mainstream of that movement is extremely culturally chauvinistic, is perhaps misogynistic in certain ways, but has moved away from the explicit racialized politics that framed American politics in the past. In, in, the sh in other words, there's a kind of new national, uh, uh, right-wing nationalist, coalition being built, which is based on a right-wing interpretation of an American civic nationalism that has greater flexibility uh, to accommodate, you know, obviously non-white people than American nationalism in the past. Let's not forget 
American nationalism and right-wing American nationalism has gone through several permutations historically. There was a time where uh, Catholicism was seen as totally disqualifying uh, for for, for people. Now, you know, Catholics dominate the Republican appointed Supreme Court. And have so, now for like 30 years. 30 years. So we have Catholics used to be hunted by the Klan in the United States. But right. now we so so you have all these people screaming about racism. When in fact Trump's appeal was not primarily on traditional racial lines, it was certainly along nationalist lines. There was certainly xenophobia. Uh, within that movement, but he was forging what Vaughn astutely observed is a, you know, racialized politics is not the only form of extreme right-wing politics you can have. You can have one which is framed by religion. You can have one that is framed in terms of patriarchy and masculinity, uh, which de-emphasizes the racial component. And I think liberals uh fighting this battle against the against racism which people who are not super uh uh politicized are like well you know look there's like Candace Owens there's all these you know I see black conservatives uh, and, and and they seem the 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 republic Mitch McConnell has his you know granddaughter married to a black man the the claims that these are hardcore clan racists just doesn't ring true and people don't buy the democratic line because because normie liberals uh, don't understand the transformation taking place in the right wing coalition, uh, which is being you know forged together by uh, by money coming from people who are perhaps you know like well, I, I don't I don't totally dis- disavow the racialized component of the reactionary right because the reactionary right there's a certain racial element that still makes of course pop that that is an underlying concurrent and it's tied up with nationalism what they can do is that they can stay they can soften the racial element by massing it around nationalism masculinity manhood and things of that in that way and I think that I, where I might disagree with Gene is I think that Trump was more racialized than Bush was in terms of the rhetoric, particularly around Mexicans, by without a doubt, without particularly around how he, he talked about other communities and foreign immigrants as well. I think that the reason Trump was so triggering to liberals is because he was just, he was just crass in saying mm-hmm. things that normally they realize they hear around themselves all the time. And his unwillingness to demonstrate a certain type of social politesse, a politeness around the discourse was too offensive to their state. They, they could not tolerate that America could uh, would accept someone so crass being president when frankly, Trump's rhetoric was a lot more calm than what most Americans say all the time, anyway. A lot of people the, the, efforts. Part of it too is that, like, hey, not everybody knows everything. Not everybody hears all the things that Trump's here that Trump says. You know, they just pick they'll, they'll pick one thing and then they don't have to think about it again. Um, but uh, also too is that that political ideology doesn't often come into the decision making uh, when people go to vote, right? Like. Yeah. Um, there's and this is where you know me like coming back from like where <laughs> my my experiences of working in government is like there are people who 100 know policy like they know how policy works and then it just doesn't matter right they would say oh sure, amy klobuchar kind of and then elizabeth warren you know it like the, a kind of racism that can make an indian who's been in america for less than 20 years a latino a black Haitian or a Nigerian or even a black American male feel like I like that guy because he doesn't take shit from anybody else and he says mm-hmm. the truth. Some of these people don't deserve to be here because there are people in those constellations. Yes, who yeah. they think just like Trump, and they yeah. think they're not talking. He's not talking about them. No, and that's what I mean. Like I'm not, my, I'm, I'm my parents, not only that, 
uh, liberals them sorry sorry marcus you go ahead oh i was like i mean like my parents are 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 jamaican there's <laughs> they are homophobic as as hell like you know like over fucking time i guess it's like become less but like like they were like pete pete booty judge kisses his fucking husband and my mom goes ew it's like what's ew what's ew what's what's really going on here right and it's like oh hey this is a black person that says that i mean my parents describe themselves as a socialist fucking from michael manley's camp but if there's not a complete you know i guess understanding like of 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 where yeah what what actual like liberation means but like the fact is that right there's like black people can be racist against other fucking people you know and like oh you know like, they can be prejudiced based off of ethnicity or race against other people just like asian people can mexican people whatever the fuck it doesn't and let's not let's not pretend that there is not a significant amount of racism even if it's not explicit amongst american liberals there's a reason there is a reason why s s that jennifer krug woman could masquerade a woman from can a jewish woman from kansas city could masquerade as an afro latino literally wearing hoop earrings and talking like a the, 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 like a you know in in a ridiculous stereotype of an accent right yeah because liberals themselves hold many of those prejudices about what people of color how they should be and what they should perform as they may not be overtly hostile to them but they have a kind of bigotry of low expectations uh, and uh, and so they're like oh yeah of course this person who's from this community to prove that like they're authentic because they uh, uh, speak in a particular way you know like when you have white leftists criticizing someone like uh, Brianna Joy Gray for not being authentically black it's like why because Ding. she doesn't conform to what their stereotype of a black person should be and, and and I think for a lot of people maybe I'm wrong here but I think for a lot of people uh, in minority communities, they also don't like being stereotyped by liberals or being used by liberals as cultural props in order for them, uh, for those those uh, liberals to prove their love of diversity and culture. I, I forget the author, but there was a there was a Asian American uh, uh, academic who did a study on how you know in certain communities diversity was prized and she recounts a story where she was invited to a wedding so that the bride could feel that the that she didn't have an all white wedding and she had diversity so i think there are also fundamental problems with racism in liberal Did people America. pay for that did people pay for that type of thing I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you could make a make extra money by being I, a black friend. I we'll, think, we'll, I, I think, uh, yeah. I mean, rent's going we'll, up for we'll, me. We've been going for a while. We, we should just wrap up. It's going on two and a half. Uh, any guys got anything you want to plug? Don't forget again. We're going to be in New York City with Sublation Media on June twenty sixth to promote our our meeting with Sublation Media at the project parlor in new york city in brooklyn on the 26th we'll come check us out jason and i will be there uh check out jason's last video essay same as it ever was it was very good check out our reaction video varn where can people find you at you can find me at varn blog where i uh talk about all kinds of stuff um uh, from philosophy to how uh, educational culture makes people fundamentally unable to communicate with other people. Uh, so, you know, I talk about all kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, I don't, I, I want to say this as, as a last word. I don't say anything I say to make people feel hopeless because I actually don't fundamentally think we are in the worst place we can be yet, but we lost the last battle and we lost it. Like, like the left, whatever. I don't even know what the left is anymore, really. 
but like this weird coalition of socialists and progressives and and centrist democrats we did what i was afraid of that i've been afraid of since 2018 injecting a sense of vitality into the center um and then watching it be finally unable to go and i think if you you find go to varm blog you can hear me talk about the style of stuff and you can hear me talk about stuff like inflation rates profitability uh various theories of international and monetary transfers uh sea lands uh, boring shit that you should actually know um because a lot of this stuff is uh a lot of the stuff that we talk about in and and like in socialist circles, I think is actually downstream of the important things. I mean, I, and I think like Pascal, the sort of the the, the low key implication, a lot of what you've been saying too. Um, so yeah, you can check me out there. Um, I'm probably writing a response to this Bernie piece for Gene there. Um, he asked me to do it, so I'll probably do that. If that comes out, you can find uh, that probably at Sublation Media. Gene uh, is still rocking and rolling at Sublation Magazine. Yeah. Trying to keep me on 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 the uh, the pay the payroll and putting out these pieces, staying on my behind as he should be, so I can get some work out here for the mag. Check out Sublation Magazine. Marcus, our man, who was once upon a time our man in Maine, but is now a man in Virginia. Well, hope and then Pascal, are you going to be in New York? I'm I'm planning to be be there. You're going to be able to make it. I am there. I already got a ticket and everything. Hell yeah! Hell yeah! Well. I got nothing to plug other than that. Left link vet to everyone knows. This what was a about. great show. Uh, went a little longer than we normally do, even though this is our free Saturday show. Can Jason I say one will be thing? back on on Thursday, Tuesday. Gene, myself, and a wonderful guest we had had a great conversation on Turkey and Germany, and Turkish and Kurdish politics overall. It was a great chat. That's going to be our Tuesday stream. Jason will be back on Thursday for a political roundup. And that pretty much sums up where we are. Thank you for watching us at This Is Revolution Podcast. As we say on This Is Revolution Podcast. And by the way, thank you to our wonderful, wonderful assistant here, M2 Sun. I'm happy to help. I just want to say on YouTube, we have over 200, <clears throat> over 200 viewers and only 133 likes. Please hit like for us, share the show with your friends. Like, subscribe, share, hit the bell, do all of the above. Introduce your people to Pascal. He's here every week. That's correct. I'm Fair. always here. But on that note, folks, we are out.